Paul Greenberg, you are a best-selling author who focuses on ocean and environmental issues. But today, we are here to talk about your latest book, Goodbye Fun, Hello World, 60 Ways to Disconnect from Tech and Reconnect with Joy. Paul, thank you for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. It's great to be here. So uh, I have a hate-love relationship with this tool here. Yeah. Uh, I developed my hate relationship uh, one time that I was working. I used to be an Airbnb host. I used to have five properties, and I was a slave of this tool here. And it just, it just, I just got fed up, and I did as much as possible to disconnect from it. And now it just drives me crazy when I go to, let's say, a fancy restaurant and I see a beautiful couple and they're not talking to each other. They're all talking Absolutely. to somebody else in their phone. And it just the more I'm aware of it, it's just like a, like a cigarette smoker who quits smoking and all of a sudden the, the smell of cigarettes bother him. So that's me with the phone and I'm just so refreshed to see that someone is writing about these issues. So I'm, I'm just delighted to have this conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I've certainly, I've seen, seen the exact situation with the exact couple. She's beautiful. He's handsome. They look like they should just be staring into the, each other's eyes with passion. And instead, who the heck knows what they're looking at? It's so upsetting. And, um, you know, the, the, the epigraph, the opening epigraph of the book, is from the monk Thich Nhat Hanh, who he says, life can only be lived in the, in the present moment. And that really struck me like a ton of bricks. And, and like you, once I gave up my phone, for me, the analogy isn't so much smoking. It's more, it reminds me a bit of The Matrix. Do you remember the film, The Matrix? Yeah. And yeah. how when he takes the red pill, and everything is revealed to him. It's like when you are always looking into your phone all the time, you don't realize that everybody is also doing the same thing. And suddenly when your phone is down and you are looking up, it's like, it's like you've changed species or something. Um, and you know, the other thing on that front, which also led me, I, you know, we can talk about what led me to this particular decision. But one thing that along the way to, to breaking the habit was um, my, um, father-in-law, 93 years old, um, and he often comes into New York. He, he liked to come into New York because he liked to come in and take pictures um, of people's faces. He's sort of an amateur photographer. But um, a few years ago, he stopped doing it because you could never get anyone's face. Literally could not get a face. Wow. So wow. Yeah. anyway. Okay, so let's go back and can you tell us a little bit about yourself? You are an author, but you know, tell us about your career and who yeah. are you? And then we get into how do you get into this hey relationship yeah. with the phone? Well, so um, I'm always been attached to, you know, professionally to the outside. Um, and, uh, you know, from an early age, I was a big birder, a big fisherman. Uh, my mother was a very crazy environmentalist and we did all sorts of kinds of things. Um, but I kind of came to the environment <clears throat> through fishing. Um, I was a big fisherman as a kid. And um, eventually, as I started um, writing more and more, I found that there was around <clears throat> the early or mid aughts, there was a lot of interest in the crisis that was going on in the oceans with overfishing and so forth. And because I had a science writing background and because I was also a fisherman, it was sort of a unique pathway to use the eyes of a fisherman to look at the problem of fishing and of aquaculture. So I spent, um, spent, you know, probably from about 2006 to about 2018, almost exclusively writing about um, ocean and environmental issues. Um, but this book, the new book, I'll pull it back from the shelf, Goodbye Phone, Hello World. Here you, you can even look through it, you see. Um, uh, that came about actually for two reasons, one, was that when I went out into the field and with, with biologists and um, fishermen and so forth, what was really interesting was being out in the field with people who here we are in the middle of nature and so forth, and more and more people were turning away from the nature in front of them and looking into their phones. And they always claimed a work excuse or whatever, but then when you start to look at the data, you realize that something like 40 to 50% of the time that people are on their phones, they're looking at social media, which i.e. mostly nonsense. Um, 
so there was that. And then the other issue is that because of my work, I travel quite a bit. Um, I'm, when I add it all up, I'm probably, before COVID, I was probably on the road one to two months out of every single year. And um, I have a son. And as I say in the opening line of the book, um, you know, my son was born in 2006. The iPhone was born in 2007. Um, and they've been uh, fighting for my attention ever since. Um, and when I suddenly started counting up how many hours we're, we're on our phones, about 1400 hours a year, that's one waking month per year over a full waking year over the course of a decade. So that is very disturbing. And I suddenly realized that I actually lost the whole year of my life that I could have been spending with my son to my phone. And that was a really devastating moment. And I suddenly realized that there's always, now I have a whole crop of younger friends who have kids growing up. And in a way, this book was a, a message for them that like, don't do what I did. You know, don't lose those hours to big tech, spend them on your child. Um, go back to your life. Uh, you spend a lot of time in nature. Uh, my question is, are we losing a bit of that contact with nature? I mean, we live in these huge cities and, and we don't even know where our food comes from. We just yeah. think it just uh, comes from some kind of factory, which in fact it does. <laughs> uh, but but I, I feel like those moments of you going to a mountain or a lake and, and find yourself in that in by that beautiful atmosphere it's slipping away from us the only time we see nature nowadays is on movie theaters or in our computer screens and or or, or, on, or on instagram right you know right. you know uh, i was actually during the research for this book i was talking to people involved with national parks and so forth and they said that one thing that's become problematic is that particularly beautiful places have been overused like moments that have views those particular areas are over trampled because people are not interested in the rest of the natural experience. They're just interested in the place where they can take a good selfie. Um, I completely agree with you. We are getting more detached from nature, but as is relevant to the Goodbye Phone book, what's particularly notable is that to truly take what nature has to offer from a mental perspective requires a different relationship to time. And it requires a patient observation for the way that the natural world unfolds before you. There's no swiping left. There's no swiping right. There's a lot of boredom. There's a lot of um, unpleasant moments. But that suffering through those boring moments or those less unpleasant moments brings a deeper revelation and deeper sense of peace, I think, than coming across a beautiful picture on Instagram. It's hard won but it's worth winning. And so, you know, many people have said to me, and I think even you, Alan, when we were having a back and forth over the phone, you were saying that what you did is basically you stripped all, you got rid of your data plan, right? And you just, you're just only doing text and phone at this point, except when you're in Wi-Fi range. Um, I just feel that unless we put some kind of stop on our, you know, the, I make the argument in the book that uh, it's not really your fault that you are looking into your phone all the time. Billions of dollars have been spent mm. to enforce that addiction. So it's really, really hard to fight. I ha I'm happy that you found a solution that works for you. My solution, I realized at a certain point, I tried all different things and clearing the apps off and blah, blah, blah. the only thing that in the end worked for me was just to get rid of the iPhone and use a flip phone. And so when I need to do more interactive related work related things. I just go to my computer, but at least in the time between when I leave my computer at home, go out into the city, do things, I have taken the red pill, right? Like I'm slipping away from the matrix and having a few hours to myself where I have my own thoughts and my own way of thinking. Right, so, um, so there's an utilitarian um, use of the phone. And yeah. I think what you are, arguing is that we just shouldn't oh, <laughs> i mean if i use my phone as an alarm clock i yeah. that's not what you are arguing about you are arguing about the useless scrolling of of nonsense that robots from the attention that we could be giving either to nature our environment or to other human beings Am exactly yeah but you know what i actually would take issue with you using your phone as an alarm clock 
not you per se, because you already have some safeguards in place to keep you from going. But I actually do make the point in the book, don't use your phone as your alarm clock, because again, your alarm goes off, you reach for your phone, and then you're starting to scroll. You know what I mean? You right. need to create these separations between these things. But, you know, there is a movement going on. And I don't know if you've, there's a film out called um, The Social Dilemma. Um, uh, have you seen it? Uh, no, but uh, everyone talks about it. So. Yeah, it's worth watching. Um, and, you know, one of the things that comes up in that um, movie is, you know, the sense of that there needs to be humane technology. That, you know, there's obviously utilitarian, very, very great utilitarian benefit to things that are on the iPhone. Like this summer, I became friendly with an editor whose son is diabetic. And her iPhone actually is able to track his blood sugar levels even when he's staying at a friend's house so that she knows when to call the parents of his friend and say, Hey, it's time to give my child a candy bar, you know, just to keep his blood sugar levels up or whatever. So that's amazing. The problem is that all these things are interwoven mm. so that you can't check one thing without being susceptible to checking another and another and another. And before you know it, we only have so many moments. You know, it's funny, you were asking about my background. I must have been early, early obsessed with this idea because I remember once when I was about eight years old, I asked my mother, how many seconds are there in life? Wow. Okay. And we sat down and we calculated, we, you know, how well, you know, if you live, average person lives to 78 and da, 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 da. And we came up with a number. I don't you know what it must have been, trillions or something, maybe billions. But still, that it's finite, right? Like we always, especially I think before, you reach middle age, you think it's infinite, but the more you, and probably that's another reason is that, you know, this book came out when it did, because I'm 53 and you realize you don't have that many seconds left. And every second that you give away to big tech is a tiny robbery, you know? Okay, so um, let's go in the subject matter of your book. Uh, you talk about 60 ways to disconnect from tech and reconnect with joy or to joy. Yep. Can you just share a few more of those ways that we can disconnect from tech? Yeah, well, you know, we talked a little bit about the alarm clock, um, but I think um, the, f it, the morning is a really key time, I think. And um, I, think, I think I'm not alone in saying that the morning is my most productive time. I mean, there are those people who, who are middle of the night types, um, but I think it's important to identify that most productive, productive time and to protect it. Um, the most creative time of the day. So for me, the morning's most productive time. So what I try to do is I shut down all, I completely shut down all devices the night before. So I don't use an iPhone, but I shut down my, I don't put my computer to sleep. I shut it down. So it's not a question of just, I can't just go over and hit the button. Another thing is um, sort of interesting is um, that I recommend is starting a dream journal. So that I feel, you know, I'm also a fiction writer. Um, and you know, the, 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 the interface between sleeping and waking that key moment is often the most interesting time to be, to think in a, an imaginative way. So rather than going right to the phone or right to the scrolling, you could keep a dream journal where you take a, a journal is dream journal is basically one on one side of the page, you have words on the other side, you have images and you just do that every single morning and create a habit out of it. In addition to that, the other thing is to possibly think about creating a, a kind of habit um, that is enforcing of a creative practice that you'd always like to do. So maybe it's watercolor, uh, maybe it's poetry, maybe it's piano, but trying to find out some practice that you can do first thing in the morning that is exclusive of the phone, um, I think is a really good way to start. So, you know, there are many more things. The book is meant to be not so kind of didactic, like it's also kind of silly and fun sometimes. Um, like, you know, for example, when you count up the hours, 1400 hours a year, according to the US Foreign Service, in that amount of time, you can actually learn two languages <laughs> in the court, you know, 700 hours, six plus 700 hours to achieve wow. sort of base level fluency in a language. So I actually have put my money where my mouth is and I've been studying Greek. Wow, um, great. And I and, and I do about half an hour of Greek a day. I can't. I I can say venka uh, televeno elenika polikala, but I'm you know I'm not. I don't speak Greek very well, but I don't understand very well. But it's coming, and it's something that I have that I wouldn't have had if I'd just gone to Squirrel Lake. Wow. 
I live in Quebec, uh, which is a French province. And if I go to a store and I don't speak French, they throw me out of the store. I mean, oh, that's nice. Yeah, not physically, <laughs> but you know, they, but if I speak broken French, they automatically switch to English to help me out. But if I go and speak English to them, they just completely ignore me. So that's, <laughs> that's really funny. But um, okay, uh, I was looking through your Amazon reviews and the lowest review you have is a three star. Yeah. And is someone who says that it's irrealistic to give up our phones. Do you think yeah. certain amount of us have gone so far into our dependence with the phone that it is in fact unrealistic? So I can totally relate to that. Um, and I am a freelance writer, so my life is more flexible than most. Um, but I also think that there's something a little cynical in that. Um, I remember the, during the first week during when I quit my phone, you have this moment of panic. You're like, well, what? A, that all my stuff is on there, all my contacts and da, 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 da. And you forget, like, Alan, how old are you? I'm 53. Yeah, so we're the same age. So, like, you remember when we were kids? You remember you had about 30 telephone numbers in your head? I remember some of them still. Yeah, exactly. I do too. And um, there's something good about that, right? Like the active memory, and it is, it has been found through research that a well-functioning memory actually leads to creativity. And by seeding our memory to the phone, we're shallowing out our memory um, over time. So I would challenge that reviewer on that front. Um, I also say um, that there are, you know, I, it's funny, the original title of the book, when I sold the book was I Quit, like small I, big Q. And they didn't like that title because they thought it was too negative. They also were worried that we'd get sued by Apple, um, which, you know, it's actually possible. They sued for, le for less than that. Um, so when, they, when, the, when the publishers came up with the title, Goodbye Phone, Hello World, they were obviously playing off of the Hello, originally they wanted to do Hello World, Goodbye Phone, um, you know, based on that, you know, that thing that, you know, it's Hello World is like opening line of code a lot of times. Yeah. So, uh, but we switched it around because, you know, psychology actually finds that ending on a positive note, ending a title on a positive note tends to make it more sort of attractive. Yeah. Um, I ended up, um, so, so I guess in a way, the title Goodbye Phone, Hello World is a little stronger than I, maybe my sentiments are. Like I'm not telling people necessarily, goodbye phone, throw it in the garbage. I'm just saying, I, that's what I did. And right. it's almost like putting some cold water in somebody's face and say, okay, you're not going to get rid of the phone, but certainly this isn't mm -hmm. normal. And this is not the correct way to lead your life. So if I lose a reviewer or two in the process, so be it. Wow. Uh, this this, uh, this uh, podcast is about you, but I just feel inclined to share two experiences. One, I went to a birthday party and everyone was taking pictures of everyone's dresses and, and, and the cake and the food and texting while the party seems it was going on somewhere else. And it was so annoying because I had made a point of disconnect from social media on my phone at that time and it, it was just horrible. And the other thing, I went out on a date with a girl that I thought it was gorgeous. She had all these amazing Instagram photos and I thought I was doing great. And the thing was to go to an outdoor concert and to dance tango outside. And in between each song, tango song, she was texting with her friends. And in the car, everywhere, she's taking photos to text. And, and I guess that was the last date I ever had with this gorgeous woman, which yeah. was not ever with me. Yeah, well, you know, um, we, in English, we have the expression, right, a picture is worth a thousand words. I sort of turned it around in the book and said, um, a, a memory is worth a thousand pictures. Mm. And think about it, you know, the memories that are burned into your, into your mind from childhood, how precious those were and are. And if you missed them somehow, um, it's sad. It's truly sad. Again, I go back to Thich Nhat Hanh. You know, life can only be lived in the present moment. And I think somebody like your, your poor date, <laughs> um, when she looks back on her life 20, 30, 40 years from now, 
mostly what she's going to remember is taking pictures. You know, how many moments lost did that moment take away from you? And, you know, you were saying, you were asking earlier, you know, what are some other things that I recommend um, to kind of reconnect to joy? One thing is, um, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, is don't interrupt the melody of conversation with a picture, either taking it or showing it. Have you ever noticed that you're in a good conversation with something, somebody and somebody think ideas are really flowing or something, and then somebody takes out their phone, you know, and then the conversation stops and everyone looks at the phone and then maybe actually, even as you're looking at the phone, they start to, they get a message and, da, 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 and then the conversation, it like evaporates in the yeah. air. Yeah. You know, I just think that, and I've always felt this, that conversation is like music. And one of the reasons I think, you know, jazz works is that jazz is a conversation and music, right? Um, and chamber music to some degree. And, you know, if, if, if you love conversation, then, you know, why would you, it's like throwing um, fingers on a blackboard into the middle of right. beautiful music, I think. Okay, Paul, uh, the last question, uh, how, what happened uh, when your son asked you for a phone? Yeah, so uh, that was the other thing, I mean, that really spurred me on to this. So my son was 12 when I was working on the book, he was in middle school. And he said, you know, he said, um, you know, what, what, when can I get a phone? You're always on your phone. And I was like, you know, you know, I don't want you to be on your phone. It's like, yeah, but you're always on your phone. And that actually compelled me to quit in the first place, because I think, you know, as a parent, you really can't, um, the best example is what you actually do, not what you say. So yeah, so we kept my son off of um, the iPhone. He had a flip phone. Um, and only recently, he just started high school, he's 14 now, and we did finally let him have a phone. But we did so, I think, I guess one lesson I'll give to parents is I don't think any child younger than high school age should have a phone. And there are many children, not just middle school, but 10, nine, eight years old who get their own phone. These, a child is not, does not have the intellectual tools to make the right choices about what to use, where to be, where to go, what to avoid. So it's very, 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 I think, uh, bad psychologically for, for kids below high school age to have a phone. Now that my son has a phone, we actually talk quite a bit about it, you know, and, you know, we ask, you know, about, we talk a lot about internet addiction, about phone addiction. Um, is he any better than any other high school student? Well, at least he knows what's at stake, you know, and I think there's a base media literacy that every child needs to be taught before they can have a phone. Wow. Okay, this reminds me, I see... I go to, I used to go to parties and I used to see mothers giving their kids their phone as a babysitter, you of know, course. all these games and whatever. So here, child, play with this and, you know, let the adults have a conversation. So it builds right from, I don't know, three, four, five years old, this addiction to this tools and that of course how are they going to give it up once they are adults or how are they going to be able to focus on a face-to-face -face conversation absolutely uh, i even hear that uh let's say in japan uh, people are having less sex because they are so into their phone could you imagine being more interested on in how many likes i get on my latest photos and having sex with a girl Unbelievable. Well, I, and actually, I, I didn't make bring up this. I have also heard that about Japan. Um, but I also uh, did mention in the book, there's a, there's a, I'll see if I can find the page. If I can't, no big deal. But um, I say embrace the, t the feel of imperfection, you know, like um, that smooth feeling of gliding across a, a smooth surface. It, I think, has made us repelled from the imperfection of, you know, skin, you know, which I don't necessarily call it imperfection, but it's irregular, you know what I mean? Right. Um, and I think um, there, I have noticed among young people, um, a wariness about touching, you know, and, you know, granted, we're in this sort of COVID moment, you know, so, you know, and, and in a way, it's kind of enforced this whole idea, right, you know, of, of like, t touching is dangerous, touching is wrong. How are we gonna get past that again, you know? And one thing I've been saying a lot is that, you know, we, so now we have this vaccine, it's an inoculation against this virus, but I feel like we're gonna need a social inoculation mm. 
against uh, this proclivity for, sp for screens. We're going to need to figure out a way to bring us back into human to human contact. Uh, before we close, I heard that you have another book for next year. Can you just tell us what is it about? Yeah, um, I have a short book. It's mostly aimed, actually, it's, to tell you the truth, it could be equally aimed at Americans as, as Canadians, but it's, it's, um, it's called The Climate Diet, 50 Ways uh, to, trim your, uh, to Shrink Your Carbon Footprint. Um, you know, most Canadians would be surprised to find that um, Americans and Canadians actually are amongst the most egregious carbon polluters in the world. Um, it's like 16 pounds per person per year in the United States, and Canada's just about the same, maybe a little bit more actually. Um, so whereas in you know Europe it's more like five or six, and um, France it's three, and India it's 1.5. So this is about how people in North America and in wasteful countries, Australia is all, also very bad, can start to think about their personal behavior and how they can shrink their carbon footprint. Wow. Okay, Paul, can you tell us one last time the title of the book and where people can... Yes, yeah, so <laughs> Goodbye Phone, Hello World, um, available at um, bookstores everywhere, online everywhere. I always prefer that people shop indie if they can. Um, I don't know what the Canadian equivalent is, but I'm um, in America, IndieBound or Bookshop.org are great places to shop. And uh, yeah, um, hopefully um, we can all... A little, little more world, a little less phone in 2021. Paul, well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Alan.